Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Elizabeth Coulson Lecture for 2023. I'm Tom Scott Smith. I'm Director of the Refugee Studies Centre, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Lamise Abdullati, who's a political scientist at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Our Elizabeth Coulson Lectures have been running for over two decades now, and this is our 27th. The series is named after the anthropologist Elizabeth Coulson, who was based at the University of California at Berkeley um, and who sadly passed away in 2016, aged 99. And Elizabeth was a key supporter of our centre, especially in the early days, and she produced some truly pathbreaking work on the social consequences of forced resettlement. So we give this annual lecture as an ongoing tribute to her, one of the pioneers of our academic field, and I can think of no one better suited to this spirit than Professor Abdullati, who's going to speak today about her recent book, Discrimination and Delegation, Explaining State Responses to Refugees. Here it is. This wonderfully written book emerged from a doctoral project at Princeton. And since it was published, it's gathered a whole range of prestigious awards, not least the best book prize in migration and citizenship from the American Political Science Association and the distinguished book prize from the ethnicity and nationalism section of the International Studies Association. Lamise's work, I think, speaks to themes that no doubt would have interested uh, Elizabeth Coulson and all of the founders of the Refugee Studies Center. Uh, among other things, it touches on puzzles about why states and individuals take particular attitudes towards refugees, why states open their borders to some groups of refugees while blocking others, uh, why states delegate the control of asylum procedures to other actors. And we're delighted that Lamise um, has come to talk to us about this book today. So welcome to you, Lamise. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have about 30 to 40 minutes for your presentation, and then we will open up for some questions with the aim of wrapping up at about five o'clock GMT or thereabouts. And you'll see at the bottom of your screens um, for the audience, a Q&A box where you can type your questions, which I will put to Lamise at the end of her talk. Um, so please think about that and type them in, and we will look forward to the discussion at the end. So thank you very much for joining us, Lamise, and I will pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much for having me. It is such an honor uh, to be delivering this lecture. Um, so I'm going to put up my slides, which hopefully should become visible to you. Can you see that okay, Tom? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, as Tom has said, I'm going to be uh, speaking about my book, uh, which was published by Oxford University Press and has recently become available in paperback. <clears throat> so I usually begin uh, presentations about the book uh, with uh, this statement uh, by Catherine Duverne um, about migration becoming the last bastion of sovereignty. And this is an observation that many people have made, um, although it's it's stated especially well here by Duverne. Um, and basically the, the notion here is that countries have generally been willing to open up their borders to uh, movements of goods and to financial flows. But population movements is where countries have really put their foot down. Uh, popula population movements is where countries have reasserted their sovereignty. And if you follow um, current and recent events, this sort of intuition uh, might seem to make a lot of sense. In the area of refugees specifically, we also often see um, government officials make reference to sovereignty as well. Here you can see uh, three statements by three very different uh, politicians from three very different countries, um, uh, essentially linking um, their decisions around refugees with concerns about sovereignty. So the Ugandan uh, Minister for Disaster Preparedness saying that, um, you know, the country's sovereignty must uh, take primacy over softness to refugees. Uh, Canadian politician uh, saying that decisions to grant or refuse refugee status are fundamental to, can to Canada's sovereignty. And finally, a Turkish official noting um, that Syrian refugee camps must remain under the control of the government because that is a sovereign right. So that seems to align with the notion of migration as the last bastion of sovereignty. But the problem is that that notion of migration as the last bastion of sovereignty cannot really account for the fact that we see countries discriminating between different refugee groups all the time. Uh, one of the canonical examples of this in the literature um, is uh, 
uh, the distinction that um, U.S. governments have historically made between Cuban and Haitian refugees, where the United States historically has been uh, much more receptive to Cuban refugees than it has been to Haitians. But this is not a phenomenon that's unique to the United States. Uh, scholars have documented similar um, examples in, uh, for instance, India uh, that uh, was more receptive to Tibetan uh, compared to Sri Lankan and Bangladeshi refugees, and Costa Rica, uh, which uh, was more receptive to Nicaraguan refugees compared to Salvadorans. So this doesn't seem to align with the notion of migration as the last bastion of sovereignty if countries are in fact um, selecting or discriminating between refugee groups. And I call this the discrimination puzzle in the book. Something else that doesn't uh, seem to align with the notion of migration as the last bastion of sovereignty is what I call the delegation puzzle. So there are a number of countries around the world where if you apply for refugee status, your application is going to be adjudicated jointly between the government of that country and the UN Refugee Agency. Um, here on this map, this is from 2011, there were 23 countries shaded here in purple where asylum applications were decided on jointly between the government and UNHCR. There were even more countries, 54 countries in 2011, where if you applied for asylum, your application would be decided on solely by UNHCR. So this is very striking. That there are a number of countries around the world that have basically given the United Nations the power to determine who gets refugee status and therefore who gets access to all of the privileges that are associated with that status. And these include countries that are usually very uh, jealously protective of their sovereignty, like China and India, also include countries like Saudi Arabia that certainly have the resources uh, to conduct refugee status determination or make decisions on asylum applications themselves. And yet they choose to delegate decision-making uh, to the United Nations. That doesn't seem to align with uh, the idea of migration as the last bastion of sovereignty. And the discrimination and delegation puzzles together give rise to the central questions that I pose in the book. So I ask why countries welcome ref some refugees while treating others poorly, and why or when countries will uh, hold on to asylum policy as opposed to handing it over to the United Nations. And what I argue in the book is that states' approaches to refugees are shaped by foreign policy and ethnic politics. At the international level, leaders are using refugees um, in order to uh, reassure their allies and put pressure on their rivals. At the domestic level, policymakers tend to favor those refugee groups who, who share their ethnic identity. Um, and then when these uh, incentives and pressures point in opposite directions, that is when policymakers shift the burden to the United Nations. So in the remainder of today's talk, uh, I'm going to uh, talk, uh, I'm going to explain sort of my, my theory uh, or my argument in a little bit more detail. Um, I'll give you a hint uh, of some of my statistical evidence that I present in the book. Um, I'll talk through parts of uh, my case study on Turkey, and then I'll conclude. So to begin, I um, define refugees fairly broadly to include individuals who are fleeing both persecution and also uh, conflict and violence more generally. The, the, um, the thing that I'm trying to explain is variation in asylum policy, which I define as the measures that are adopted by governments to regulate um, foreign asylum seekers and refugees. And crucially, I'm interested in both the laws as they exist on the books, but also their implementation. So what it is that governments actually wind up doing on the ground as well. Usually, um, it, it's very common um, in uh, studies of refugees to focus exclusively on what happens at the border, whether or not uh, people are admitted or rejected at the border. Uh, and that's certainly one part of what I consider to be asylum policy, but I also take a more expansive view. Um, so I note that governments have the option whether or not to sign relevant international treaties like the 1951 Refugee Convention and whether to extend their application to particular refugee groups. Similarly, uh, governments um, make decisions about the national legislation they're going to uh, adopt uh, and how it will be applied to various groups. Um, governments determine whether they're going to set up some uh, screening process, um, a refugee status determination process that will determine which asylum applicants uh, gain refugee status. They uh, decide whether uh, asylum seekers and refugees will be allowed freedom of movement or whether they're going to be restricted to camps. They determine um, 
whether they're going to be protected physically from agents of the state, whether they might be uh, uh, forcibly returned or deported back to their home countries. Governments also decide whether uh, asylum seekers and refugees will have access to public services like uh, education, for example, or healthcare, whether they will be allowed uh, entry to the formal labor market, and whether long-term refugees will have the possibility of integrating into the host society. So all of these come under the umbrella um, of what I'm calling asylum policy, and I'm interested in how governments make decisions on all of these factors vis-a-vis -vis particular refugee groups. <clears throat> So in the book, I argue that the variation in asylum policy um, is shaped by foreign policy and ethnic identity. So it's a two-part theory. At the international level, I argue, uh, we need to be paying attention to the relationship between the country that's generating refugees and the country that's receiving refugees. And in general, I expect that when uh, the relationship between these two countries is hostile, we're going to observe a more inclusive asylum policy. Um, alternatively, when the relationship between these two countries is friendly, I expect to see a restrictive asylum policy. And there are several reasons for this. Um, admitting refugees from a rival country and treating them well um, can help destabilize that sending government. It also discredits that sending government by saying that people are choosing the, the superior country to flee to. In addition, um, welcoming and supporting refugees from a hostile sending uh, government um, can create, uh, can allow for an opposition um, force to be present on your territory that can then launch cross-border attacks against that rival. At the domestic level, um, uh, uh, I argue that um, we need to be paying attention to the ethnic identity of uh, refugee groups and whether that matches with the identity uh, of groups in power in the refugee receiving country. Um, and when I talk about ethnicity, um, I'm using that in a very um, expansive sense. So um, ethnic identity for me refers to whatever the salient cleavages are in a given society. These may, these may be linguistic or racial or religious, uh, what have you. So in general, if uh, refugees share an ethnic identity with uh, 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 political elites in a, the country that's receiving them, I expect to see an inclusive policy. When there's no ethnic tie, I expect to see a restrictive policy. And again, there are multiple reasons for this. Admitting um, and supporting refugees who are ethnic kin and rejecting ethnic others um, can be a way to pander to uh, your constituency's desires. If you are a leader, we know that in general, people are more likely to sympathize with others whom they perceive as being uh, members of their in-group. In, in multi-ethnic societies, um, admitting and supporting refugees who are ethnic kin um, uh, uh, and rejecting ethnic others can be a way to improve or at least preserve the ethnic balance uh, in your favor if you're uh, the leader. Um, and finally, discriminating amongst re refugees in this way can you encourage your domestic populace to uh, mobilize along ethnic lines in ways that may um, uh, pose electoral advantages for leaders. So there are going to be some cases where these two sets of incentives align. There, there will be some cases where refugees are fleeing a hostile country and they're ethnic in, in which case um, uh, political leaders will be receptive to them. There will be cases where refugees are fleeing a friendly country and they're ethnic others, in which case, refu uh, in which case leaders can just shut them out. Um, in these cases, uh, there are very few reasons to want to outsource responsibility for refugees to the United Nations. But there are also going to be cases when these two sets of incentives push in opposite directions. And that's when I expect policymakers to be turning over responsibility to the UN Refugee Agency. UNHCR is uh, ideal for this sort of role. Um, uh, you know, it, it's insulated um, from uh, domestic pressures uh, and it looks neutral to both domestic and international audiences. So it's great if you want to uh, avoid antagonizing refugee sending governments or domestic constituencies. But at the same time, it's actually quite easy for governments to punish UNHCR if it oversteps. And because UNHCR personnel are um, very concerned about their continued ability to operate on a country's territory, they're very likely to self-censor as well. Policymakers know that UNHCR is going to only is only going to be able to assist limited numbers of refugees in any case. Um, and they also know that if you um, put UNHCR in charge of, say, camp management, or if you put UNHCR in charge of refugee status determination, 
leaders still uh, wield control over a whole range uh, of other elements of asylum policy, like deciding what's going to happen at the border or deciding whether or not uh, asylum seekers and refugees have access to the formal labor market. So this uh, figure summarizes my argument. Uh, when refugees are fleeing a hostile country and they are co-ethnics, I expect receiving countries to enact an inclusive policy. When they're fleeing friendly uh, countries and there's no ethnic tie, I expect to see a restrictive policy. And then there's the cross diagonal there where I expect policymakers to be shifting responsibility over to the UN Refugee Agency. So there are other um, you know, explanations that exist in the literature for why governments treat refugees the way, uh, the way they do. Um, many of these, I argue, don't do very well in explaining discrimination and delegation because they predict a one-size-fits-all policy. So for example, if we think that resources determine country responses to refugees, say wealthy um, countries uh, are going to be more receptive to refugees, or say wealthy countries are going to be less receptive to refugees. That doesn't explain um, why it is that a single government may discriminate between different refugee groups. Similarly, if we think that countries are concerned about um, security, say, uh, that countries that have recently had an experience with war or with terrorism uh, are going to be more uh, restrictive to refugees, that doesn't necessarily help us predict which specific refugee groups are going to be admitted or rejected. <clears throat> uh, and I can make a similar argument with uh, literature that emphasizes regional dynamics or democratization. But there are other explanations that um, are more helpful for trying to think about discrimination and de delegation. So for example, it's possible that uh, governments will be more receptive to those refugees who are fleeing more pervasive human rights violations. Or perhaps they're going to be more likely to uh, uh, turn responsibility over to the United Nations for those groups of refugees that are most persecuted to ensure that they're treated in accordance with international standards. It could be that governments will uh, be most receptive to those refugees who have desirable uh, skills or high levels of education, say. Um, or it could be that governments are uh, shaping their policies based on the size of refugee movements uh, that governments get especially concerned when it's a when it's a large refugee influx that they're more likely to be restrictive when it's a large number of people um, uh, and they might be willing to open up if it's uh, smaller refugee movements that they're seeing um, and finally um, it's possible that um, asylum decision making is ultimately being made by low-level bureaucrats uh, and is shaped by their own um, idiosyncratic uh, preferences and tendencies um, and so there's not necessarily much of a pattern at all uh, across refugee groups so my task in the book is trying to test my explanation against these explanations. And to do this, I adopt what I call a three-stage multi-level research design, where each step is meant to corroborate and expand on the step that comes before it. So I begin at the cross-country level with a statistical analysis uh, that um, examines all countries in the world over time. Um, then I delve into the cases of uh, Egypt and Turkey, um, and looking at how these two countries behave as refugee receiving countries um, and how they treat different refugee groups on their territory. And finally, um, I conduct a content analysis of um, statements in the Kenyan parliament to determine how politicians with different constituencies uh, speak about different refugee groups and how their statements differ from those that are issued by government officials. So I've mentioned Egypt, Turkey, and Kenya, and I was very uh, intentional about selecting these three countries. Um, there's a lot of literature on um, migration and asylum that's focused on countries in the global north, but we know that the vast majority of the world's refugees live in the global south. Um, in addition, these three countries uh, are very different from each other. Um, they differ in terms of their refugee policies. Um, and they're also different in terms of their economic conditions, their uh, regime type, and so on. And so if we can see the same patterns holding across these three very different countries, you know, that lends further confidence uh, to my findings that it might apply more broadly. I characterize Egypt as a typical refugee recipient because it, um, during the period that I'm studying it, has a relatively small number of refugees per capita. Turkey I characterize as an outlier um, because it's, uh, it, applies a unique uh, uh, def um, 
unique limitations on refugee status, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, and Kenya, uh, I describe as a crucial or critical case because it's a case that's been considered um, extensively by scholars uh, uh, from in refugee studies. Um, and of course, an important case because of the uh, protracted refugee situation there with the Somalis. <clears throat> There's also the advantage that these groups share some of the same refugee groups. So there are Sudanese refugees in both Egypt and Kenya, there are Iraqis in both Egypt and Turkey, and so on. And so I'm able, as part of my analysis, to, as it were, hold the refugee group constant uh, and compare how a single refugee group is treated across countries as well. So to uh, conduct this research, um, I did field work in all three countries and interviewed people from government, from international organizations, NGOs, and so on. Um, I also collected documents from special collections in Egypt, uh, the UK, um, and Kenya. Um, I went to the UNHCR archives uh, and collected over 6,000 pages of documents, uh, predominantly in English, French, and Arabic. Um, and then I created a comprehensive data set um, of uh, parliamentary statements uh, in Kenya, <clears throat> basically every single instance where someone uh, mentioned the words asylum, refugee, or wakimbizi in Swahili. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quickly uh, show you um, a bit of my statistical evidence. Um, so bear with me if you don't have statistical training, I'm going to try to make this as painless <laughs> as possible. Um, so basically what I do is I adopt what's called a double hurdle model or a two-step model. First, I ask, when are countries more or less likely to delegate on asylum applications? And then I ask, when they do not delegate, when countries are making these decisions themselves on asylum applications, when are they more or less likely to accept asylum applications? So I first ask a delegation question, then I ask a discrimination question. And the unit um, that I I'm using here is what's called a directed dyad year. So an example of a directed dyad year is Bangladesh to India in 1996, right? Um, that's a different observation from India to Bangladesh in 1996 and different from Bangladesh to India in 1997, say. Um, so for this uh, analysis of the delegation decision, um, my dependent variable uh, that I'm trying to explain is a variable that measures the degree of delegation, right? Whether asylum applications are processed exclusively by the government, jointly between the government and UNHCR, or exclusively by UNHCR. And my central explanatory variables, again, recall, I'm trying, my uh, explanation uh, emphasizes the relationship between the country that's generating the refugees and the country that's receiving them, and the ethnic identity of the refugees and whether it matches with the identity of uh, elites in the country that's receiving them. So I try to measure these uh, using uh, the UN General Assembly Voting Index to capture relations between the two countries, and then uh, which that ranges between negative one and one, um, and then a dummy variable, which takes it takes the value zero or one. Um, if there's an ethnic group that's in power in, in a receiving country and excluded from power in the sending country, that's a one value. Otherwise, it's a zero. And then I have an interaction term uh, for both of these variables. I control for various other things that we think might affect delegation, a delegation decision, um, including how many refugee, how many uh, asylum applications were accepted in the previous year, whether or not a country sits on UNHCR's executive committee uh, and therefore might have some say in how UNHCR operates, whether or not a country has signed on to the 1951 Refugee Convention or the, or the 1967 Protocol, um, how large the refugee population is uh, in that country, um, how many uh, country, uh, how many countries uh, they were receiving asylum applications from, um, how large this this burden of applications is, uh, how many applications they were receiving per capita, and GDP per capita, and then a lagged dependent variable. Basically, did the country delegate last year? Because if they delegated last year, maybe they're more likely to delegate this year. Um, and I use what's called an, an ordinal ordinal logit because my um, uh, my dependent variable is ordinal. So that's the first step in the analysis, asking about delegation. The second step is asking about discrimination. When countries do not delegate, are they more, when are they more or like, like uh, more or less likely to accept asylum applications? Here, my dependent variable is the percentage of asylum applications from the sending country that are approved by the receiving country in each year. Um, my explanatory variables are again the voting index and this uh, uh, ethnic affinity dummy that I described. Here I control for um, 
uh, GDP per capita in the country that's receiving refugees, but also conditions in the country that's generating refugees. What is its GDP per, GDP per capita? Is it experiencing political terror or civil conflict or interstate war or genocide? Um, and then the distance between the two countries. And here, because my dependent variable is a, a proportion, I use what's called a fractional low jet. Um, so overall, my data set has over 27,000 uh, observations and covers the period 1996 to 2005. So here I'm reporting what are called average marginal effects. This is the effect of a one unit increase of a variable on the probability of full delegation. Um, if you're intimidated by the numbers, don't be. Basically what, what this tells us is that when relations between the country that's generating refugees and the country that's receiving refugees are improving, the probability of delegation increases if the refugees are co-ethnics and it de decreases if there's no ethnic tie. Conversely, um, if we look at uh, comparing refugees who, where there's no ethnic tie and where there is shared ethnicity, the probability decreases if it's a hot, uh, the probability of delegation decreases if it's a hostile sending country and increases if it's a set, uh, friendly sending country. So these results are completely consistent with uh, what I would expect given my argument. When we look at discrimination, this here is the average predicted asylum recognition rate. So it's the average um, predicted number of asylum application, percentage of asylum applications that are going to be approved. Um, the uh, line in red is for co-ethnic refugees. The line in blue is for refugees where there is no ethnic tie. And then on uh, the x-axis here, there's sending country relations ranging from negative one, it's maximum hostility, to one, that's maximum friendliness between these two countries. So you can see here at the top uh, left-hand corner, um, when refugees are co-ethnics and they're fleeing a rival country, the average predicted asylum recognition rate is around 90%. When refugees are fleeing a friendly country and there's no ethnic tie, the average predicted asylum recognition rate is 42%, right? So this again aligns with, um, with my expectations. So this, you know, I, I'm in the book, I present this evidence first and I say, this is, you know, um, it, it lends a lot of support to my argument. It shows that it might apply broadly across countries and over time, but it's limited, of course. It's only limited to looking at refugee status determination and decisions on asylum applications, and it doesn't tell us much about um, uh, causal mechanisms, right? And so that's why uh, I present um, case studies. So let me talk to you a little bit about um, asylum in Turkey. So Turkey, uh, as I've said before, is um, I describe it as an outlier because it maintains what's called a geographical limitation to the 1951 convention. As, what this means is that as a matter of law, Turkey will only grant refugee status to European asylum seekers. Turkey has also experienced several mass uh, refugee influxes with the Iraqi Kurds, Bulgarian Turks, Bosnians and Kosovars, and more recently Syrians. So the conventional wisdom on uh, in the literature on Turkey is that Turkey does discriminate between different refugee groups and generally treats uh, Europeans well and non-Europeans poorly in line with this geographical limitation. Um, but my analysis suggests that there's more nuance uh, than this dichotomy suggests. So I'm going to talk to you about three, uh, three refugee groups um, that have lived in Turkey. So beginning with the Bulgarians. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, about 300,000 Bulgarians flee Bulgaria. They're fleeing an assimilation campaign, um, and they take refuge in Turkey. Relations between Turkey and Bulgaria are hostile. They're on opposite sides of the Cold War. Um, and the Bulgarians who are fleeing into Turkey are ethnic Turks. Um, and so the, Tur the uh, Turkish political elite certainly perceives them as co-ethnics. And so my prediction would be that this group is going to experience inclusive treatment. And that is indeed what we see. Um, Turkey very quickly, as soon as this uh, crisis begins, um, suspends fees, visa requirements for Bulgarians so that they're able to enter the country. Um, they provide them with uh, access to government housing and employment, as well as the ability to apply for Turkish citizenship. You can see towards the bottom of the slide there, there's a, a quote from uh, UNHCR uh, officials who went on mission to Turkey um, talking about how there's there's a discrepancy between um, uh, the ways that Turkey responds to refugees or ethnic Turks 
compared to refugees who are non, uh, non-Turks. It's worth noting that um, uh, right after this period, when the Cold War ends and communism collapses um, and Turkey develops more friendly relations with Bulgaria, its treatment of uh, Bulgarian refugees also shifts. Uh, they start deporting people that will no longer uh, offer visas to them. But during this period, 1989 to 1990, this group is experiencing uh, inclusive treatment. So compare uh, Turkey's responses to that group to the ways they respond to Iraqi refugees who are arriving around the same time in the late 1980s, but in smaller numbers. So tens of thousands. So I said 300,000 uh, Bulgarians. There are only tens of thousands of Iraqis who flee uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, al anfal campaign uh, into Turkey. <clears throat> um, at the time, Turkey has very friendly relations with Iraq and a series of trade agreements and so on. Um, but the Iraqis who are fleeing into uh, Turkey, uh, they are Kurds, um, certainly not considered ethnic kin by uh, Turkish political elites, um, and in fact, uh, perceived with a great degree of hostility because Turkey has uh, uh, for a long time battled uh, uh, Kurdish secession uh, claims. So. My, expe my theoretical expectation would be that this uh, group would, be, would experience restrictive policies, and that is indeed what happens. In stark contrast to the ways that uh, Turkey responded to the far larger Bulgarian influx, with the Iraqi Kurds, uh, this group is restricted to heavily guarded, closely monitored camps close to the border. Um, there are offers of international assistance to Turkey that Turkey um, refuses, um, and ultimately, Turkey sends uh, these Kurds back into Iraq. Uh, they're repatriated at the, at the first opportunity. At the bottom there, there's a, a snippet from uh, the UNHCR archives, a letter written by Iraqi refugees and sent to the UNHCR headquarters in Geneva. <clears throat> describing how for this group, uh, there's no legal status, they're being attacked by police and security services, they're being arrested, even if they attempt uh, to show documentation uh, to, to prove that they are persecuted. <clears throat> the final group that I want to talk about um, are Bosnians. So in the early to mid 1990s, over 20,000 um, people fleeing the Bosnian war seek refuge in Turkey. Um, at the time, uh, relations between Turkey um, and uh, Yugoslavia are hostile, <laughs> they're, they're strained, um, and, uh, uh, and the Bosnians are not perceived to be ethnically Turkish, uh, and so there's no ethnic tie there. My theoretical expectation would be delegation for this group, and again, that's what we see. Um, the um, Turkish officials do not treat th th this group as well as they did the Bulgarians, but also not as poorly as they did the Iraqis. They uh, do not call them refugees. They call them guests. Um, they're permitted to reside in urban areas, so they're not restricted to camps. Um, um, and um, uh, UNHCR basically uh, steps in um, uh, to assist this group. Um, at the bottom of the screen there, there's another snippet from uh, the UNHCR archives, very striking one, uh, where um, uh, uh, people from sort of the UNHCR office in Turkey um, are writing back to UNHCR headquarters uh, in Geneva, telling them that uh, the UNHCR in Turkey uh, always has to tread very lightly, uh, and avoid and that the delegation UNHCR delegation in Turkey avoids using the term refugee because the term refugee has uh, provoked a negative reaction uh, from Turkish authorities in the past. Um, the snippet also sort of mentions the fact that UNHCR engages in self-censorship. So to sum up, um, it, it seems as though Turkey's asylum policies don't fit neatly within a European, non-European dichotomy, right? The Bosnians um, and the Bulgarians are both European, um, but treated differently. Rather, it looks like the group-specific variation in Turkey's asylum policies is more consistent with my argument. There's also no evidence that Turkey's policies are shaped by humanitarianism, right? The, the Iraqi Kurds are also fleeing um, brutal repression. Um, they're treated very differently uh, from the Bulgarians. Um, it, there's no evidence that Turkey, Turkish officials are discriminating amongst Turkish refugees based on their skills or their education levels. Um, Turkey winds up being much more generous towards the much larger refugee movement while shutting out the smaller one. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that these decisions are being made high up in the Turkish government. Right. 
So to conclude my talk, I've argued that foreign policy and ethnic politics shape whether countries will welcome refugees, exclude them, or shift the burden to the United Nations. There are several implications for scholarship uh, of this study. Um, this uh, question of delegation especially is a, a puzzling uh, question, and it's one that, that is understudied. Um, and so I hope that the book as a whole uh, contributes to the literatures on the politics of migration and asylum, uh, on political responses to globalization, and also international human rights. Um, there are there are also implications for policy. Um, so I suggest that uh, you know if if my argument is correct, then UN agencies and NGOs uh, should be much bolder about targeting their advocacy and assistance towards particular refugee groups, um, and also that concerned states and the international community should recognize that there are going to be some cases when exerting pressure is not going to bear fruit, um, and other tools like resettlement need to be used instead. Um, so this final slide just gives you a sense of the breakdown of chapters uh, in the book, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Lemis. That was a fantastic presentation and an admirable contribution to the literature. And I just want to say the clarity of exposition there, especially in the articulation of your two central puzzles, is uh, really a model and a fascinating range of methods as well that allow you to drill down at each stage and um, also justify the decisions you've made. So um, I really appreciated the way that you explained how you got to your conclusions.